Hello, everyone, and welcome to the series Explore More Bark Less. This is the Peaceful Home Edition. Today, we'll be talking about management and how to keep your dog happy in their home and in their yard. I am Caitlin Thomas, and I am your presenter today, and Kate Wilson was the co-creator of this presentation. So overview, we're going to talk today, this is in three, three little sections, management in the home, management outside of the home, and application and recap. So understanding management. So one of the important things that we think about is what does what is management, what does it mean, and how will it help us with our reactive dogs? So remember when we're talking about reactivity, that reactivity, the barking, lunging, or even hiding or running away is not something, those are not behaviors that happen as standalone behaviors. There is a purpose for those. So all of all of behavior serves a purpose for animals. And our job when we're talking about how we're going to create a peaceful home setting for our dogs or a um, comfortable yard experience or a comfortable exercise experience for them in their home, what we really wanna focus on is eliminating the dog's need to react or, or the, um, you know, the, the feeling that they're under pressure or they're uncomfortable or they're stressed or frustrated to the point where you see the reactivity. So what we're going to focus on is creating a safe place where they can essentially live. So we think of all of the things that go into um, the stress kind of that contributes to a reactive dog's life. And it's our job when they're living in our home and in our yard to make sure that we minimize as much as possible that stress kind of in their day-to-day -day life. So when they're eating, playing, relaxing, we'd like them to be free from stressors. So benefits of creating a solid management plan the benefits are not just for your dog, but also for you. So when we think of what it's like to live with a reactive dog, a lot of times the biggest thing that we find when we start working with reactivity or working with um, the guardians of reactive dogs is that it doesn't, the, the dogs reacting inside the home doesn't just affect the dogs, but it also affects their guardians and the people in their home and around them. So a lot of times, you know, you think of um, everyone's watching a movie and the dog hears something scary outside and runs to the door and starts barking and lunging at the door or going from window to window trying to figure out where the sound is or um, you know we think of their they go outside you let them out to go potty and they rush to the gate and start barking and lunging that doesn't just upset the dog but oftentimes really frustrates the people around the dog and prohibits them from being able to really um, connect or or relax with them in their home and so we want to try to create as much of a trigger-free place as possible, not just for the dog, but also for the people that live with them. Um, <clears throat> we think of what else management does, decreases stress. So by management, what we mean is basically managing the environment in a way where the dog does not have to experience its stressors or triggers unless we decide to, um, you know, essentially not, not seeing or hearing their triggers unless we decide. So unless we, um, you think of like a, um, a privacy fence would be an example of management for a reactive dog. So the privacy fence is essentially making it so that the dog doesn't have to see the triggers on the other side or see the dogs on the other side. So that's what we, sorry, I kind of jumped ahead there. That's what we mean when we talk about management. Um, so it helps ensure that the trainer or handler is prepared for the exposure. So when we set up things, um, you know, when, when we're talking about management plan, we set up things to kind of manage the dog's environment or prevent them from seeing or experiencing their triggers. We're trying to essentially ensure that the dog has the ability to relax and, and kind of settle and know that everything is safe and everything is fine unless we decide to set up a controlled exposure. So it decreases stress in between exposures, increases their ability to rehearse and grow other behaviors. So you think of what what would a dog, so if, if they spend, say, 60% of their time looking out the window waiting for a dog to come by because they're maybe fearful of dogs, what would they be doing in that 60% of time if they weren't rehearsing the reactivity? So we think of this sort of like, um, you know, the dog only has so much time in the day and so much brain power in the day to do various behaviors. So what we want to do is we want to basically eliminate that dog's, um, you know, whatever it is that allows that dog to be exposed to their trigger when we're not really ready. And then we want them to practice other behaviors in that time. So maybe something like relaxing on the couch or 
relaxing on the floor and being tapped by a person or chewing on a bone or playing with toys. We really want that time to be filled with other things. So when we, if we have our, say, our open window and the dog is looking out at dogs who are passing, what we would like, what would we like that to do? With, <laughs> sorry about that. What would we like that dog to do instead? So we have to give them other, other things to do in that time. And that's something kind of a benefit of a management plan. Minimizes accidental exposure and then decreases frustration. Windows. So I kind of jumped ahead a little bit in our intro there, but one of the things that we like to do for our dogs that are reactive is we like to give them uh, essentially this, this little thing you see right on here on the bottom is a window covering. So that isn't the window itself. That is actually a film that goes on top of the window. It's very inexpensive. It's maybe 15 or $20. Um, sometimes you can find it for around 10, but you can get it on Amazon or Home Depot or Lowe's. Um, but it's just a covering that goes over there and you can pull it off if you're you know, if you decided to move or you sold your house, you could take that off. Um, but really what we want to do is we want to reduce the visual exposure. So we want to reduce the amount of time that that dog is um, spending, essentially seeing what it's scared of outside of the times that we're intentionally setting up training for that dog. So if we're trying to train, say our dog is dog reactive, and we're trying to train them that when you see a dog on walk, I would like you to maybe look the other way, come with me, um, but, but really we want them to feel comfortable and safe as our overall goal so that we see that we, so that we can get the behavior that we'd like. So say you're training and you're training, you know, every day you're taking your dog for a walk and you're starting your training plan on a walk. But then when you're not home, the dog is inside of the house. And maybe when you go to work, it sits and it looks out the window at dogs that pass. One of the things that happens is that we think of how often is that dog practicing that reactivity or that barking and lunging to manage its stress or its frustration when we aren't really planning on that dog um, being trained at that time. So we think of if our dog is inside and we see that that dog is barking and lunging from inside of the window and we're trying to get that to stop, we don't want that dog to be exposed when we're not physically there working on the training. So what the window film does is gives us an opportunity to essentially block off access so that when we're not prepared, the dog doesn't see its triggers. So another thing, kind of a, another good advantage, like I was talking about in the first scenario, is say you're sitting down watching a movie, you don't necessarily want your dog barking at every single thing that passes or every, every movement or every person that it sees or every dog or every squirrel in the yard. So this is one of those things that can really make a big difference for our dogs, especially our dogs that spend a lot of time reacting at the window. So if they're reacting at the window, then they're likely under a large amount of stress at that time, and it's practicing a behavior that we would like to end. So we think of how could we make that dog feel more comfortable and put it in a place where he didn't or he or she didn't quite feel like they had to be, um, you know, barking and lunging to send away those triggers, and this is a really good solution. One of the things that people always ask is, what does it look like on the outside? So I just threw in this picture on the right so that you can kind of see what it looks like it's almost unrecognizable. So a lot of times people, this one goes just above the halfway mark on the window. You can see a nice little line there. Um, and so this one doesn't cover the whole window. It's just halfway down and you can't even really notice that transition there. So it doesn't, doesn't look like much, but it really makes a big difference. Doors, putting extra locks or childproof safeties on doors are really helpful. So key combinations for public side gates and doors are something I'm a really big fan of. So you think of what are the kind of what could happen if the worst thing happened is always what I like to ask myself. So worst case scenario, what is this going to look like for my dog? So we, whether your dog is human reactive or dog reactive or reactive towards bikes or reactive towards skateboards, one of the, the common things that you, that everyone has to think about is, what happens if my gate is left open? What happens if a door is left open? And so we want to make sure that we're doing as much as we possibly can to prevent those accidental exposures. So, um, you know, we, we oftentimes will even hear people saying, oh, my daughter was going outside. She was walking into the front yard and I didn't quite catch her. I wasn't physically with her. And then our reactive dog slipped out from behind her. So we think of things that might be able to help is childproof safety is those are really great so making sure that an adult is there to physically know when you know physically help the child get outside while the dog stays inside 
Um, the gates and doors, I will do that for every inside and outside door. Right now we're focusing on inside, um, inside the home, but I will also do those outside of the home so that if someone like a um, utility worker or a child loses their baseball maybe and tries to come into your yard or the people that are mowing the lawn come at a date that isn't the normal time or day that they come, we really wanna make sure that we're routing those people where we want them to go, which is around to the front door so that we can help our dogs make sure that they're comfortable and they're safe and they're contained while those people are moving, even if the dogs are human social. So even if the dogs are good with people, it doesn't necessarily mean that that person is going to remember to shut the gate or is going to remember to shut that extra door. And so we just wanna make sure that whoever the primary handler is for that dog or primary guardian is actually there to help facilitate that to make sure that that dog is safe. Something else I'll do is signs on front doors for visitors. So for dogs that are very reactive to sounds like knocking or doorbells, I will put a sign while we're training that says dog in training, please don't knock or ring doorbell. And then oftentimes I'll put a phone number for emergencies, call this number if you need me. Um, but it's a really nice way to kind of push those people uh, to, to the unnecessary knockers are not knocking on the door and your dog is rehearsing the barking and lunging and experiencing quite a, month, quite a bit of stress. Baby gates. So another thing that we'll use often is baby gates. So these are really great. You'll see here on this left photo, there are two baby gates. So what's happening here is that the guardian of these dogs uh, is working on integrating two dogs who are, one dog is dog reactive and one dog is dog aggressive. And so she's working on getting those dogs to be able to make friends. It's a pretty high, um, you know, kind of high stakes thing if something happens accidentally. And so we make sure that that management in that house is very strict. So everything she does is very intentional. She knows where all dogs are at all times. And then these baby gates help to keep everything safe so that if she shuts that door, but it doesn't latch all the way and the wind blows, if a dog gets free, there's a baby gate right there to hold them. And then there's another additional little airlock area there where if he happened to get through the gate, there's still another gate there. So just some extra things, you know, kind of some nice little safeties to consider. One dog lives on one side, one dog lives on the other side, and then every exposure is intentional and is in training. So the dogs aren't getting any accidental exposures where they see each other and they have an opportunity to either react at one another or scare each other or um, anything like that. So the baby gets are really nice for that. On the right side, you'll see a dog, a sweet little guy, his name is Leroy, and he is practicing in here getting ready for um, his guardian was having a baby. And so we were working with him because he is, um, he is fearful of new people and he is fearful of new sounds and movements. And so for him, we use this nice little, uh, nice little gate here that goes across the whole hallway to help keep him on a side that's comfortable for him and so that he's safe and so is the baby when the baby arrives. Combining management tools. So this is one that is really, I, I really like to do where you'll use multiples. So you saw in the last, the last little slide that there were two baby gates and this is actually the same style of baby gate in here. I will send this to you afterwards in a video or in a um, link so that you have it. So here we have a baby gate across the door. So we have a shut door, we have a baby gate there, and then we also have this little pen around that door. So this does two things. Similar to in the last photo, how we had those two kind of natural places where you could put a baby gate, you can't really do that here just by the nature of this room. So kind of think of ways that you might be able to get creative in your own house and with your own dogs, depending on what your kind of constraints are. You can really get creative and there are a lot of really um, reasonable ways to do that financially that, that don't cost too much money. So this little baby gate, or I'm sorry, this little pen around here, I'll use that for two things. One, I have two dogs, this is in my home. I have two dogs here who are um, working on making friends. And so we will use this one dog. I might use this as my safety where I say, okay, this is where you live on the side of this door. This dog lives on the side of this door. And we kind of rotate moving each dog in and out so they don't see each other unless it's intentional and I mean for it to happen. Um, another thing I'll use this for is while we're trying to make friends, while these two dogs are trying to build a relationship, I will open up that door while one side, while one dog is on one side of the baby gate, the other dog can be on the other side of this black pen here. So they just have a nice little, you know, three feet space in there where 
they can really kind of get some distance. So one of the dogs in particular is, is pretty fearful of new dogs. And so he needs a little bit of space. And the other dog is um, really interested in coming in really quickly. And so those things don't really mean, they don't really make for um, a nice introduction for these dogs. And so one of the things that you'll do is kind of keep this extra little space when you're training so that you're not having to hold your dog back or away, but you can get some natural distance there in a way that doesn't feel frustrating. Um, growing alternative behaviors. This one can't quite be overstated. So when we think of, again, what all the ways that we can prohibit our dog from seeing their triggers or help eliminate their triggers when we're not intending on them seeing them, dogs really need more to do in that time. So if that's something that your dog is used to doing where they sit in front of the window and bark at people that pass or they bark at dogs that pass or maybe they bark at the fence line or they run up and down the fence line at a certain time of day. Um, what we want to do is not just say, we would like to eliminate this behavior or we would like to make you more comfortable to the point where you don't display that behavior, but we also wanna make sure that there are really good replacement behaviors that feel really good to that animal while we're working on getting um, you know, our training in. So some of the ways that we do that will be with food hunts. So one of the really fun things to do inside the house is I will put food, I'll put my dog maybe in his crate and I will go and take his food and spread it all around the house in little piles and then send him on a food hunt. So very similar to like an Easter egg hunt. I might put little special treats in a couple of them or I might put a little piece of cheese in one or um, maybe one of his favorite bones in one. What I want to do is I want to create a, a something to do, something for the dog to do that is a little bit high arousal because that's going to be what they're seeking while we're kind of trying to work on um, getting them to be comfortable and getting them to, to kind of be more um, relaxed in the space. So we want to give them a, a nice behavior that meets the need that they're seeking to meet, which might be something high arousal and it might be a seeking behavior. So those that, that meets both needs for that. So I will send them, I will send them on a hunt. And then maybe that's the way they eat their meal. Specifically, if they're uncomfortable during certain times, or there's maybe there's a bike group that bikes by your house at five o'clock every day, that might be a good time to, to put in that uh, food hunt there so that the dog can do something else during that time. Puzzle toys, there are so many really great options. Kong Wobblers, Pet Zone IQ Ball is great, Tug Jug is great. My favorite though are the homemade puzzle toys. So things like taking your recycled egg cartons and putting your dog's food in them and having them destroy those, things like your toilet paper rolls or paper towel rolls, sticking treats inside and then closing up both ends and letting them shred that apart. Something like boxes, we'll take recycled Amazon boxes, maybe granola bar boxes, cereal boxes, put your dog's maybe um, treats in there or food in there. And once they start getting really, really good at that, what we'll do is we'll start adding difficulty just a small amount at a time, almost so the dog doesn't even notice that it's getting harder for them. So I might take a little piece of toilet paper and wrap up some treats in there and then put it in the box or paper towel. And then I might graduate to newspaper and then I might graduate to a lot of newspaper. So they really have to dig through a lot. We can really make um, make those as easy or as difficult as we need to, depending on the dog's ability level and um, what they like to, what they enjoy. Frozen treats. I will often do frozen Kongs. Kongs are really great. You can put wet food in them. You can put canned pumpkin. You could do um, anything in those. Mix up your dog's dog food with a little bit of yogurt. There's tons of things we can do. Popsicle treats. Those are great. So that would be even um, like taking maybe chicken broth in putting them in little ice cube trays with maybe a treat inside or a couple of blueberries. We can do a lot of things, fun little popsicle treats. And sometimes I'll even take those frozen treats and then put them inside of the Kong. So that's fun too. And then training games, having your dog practice something like training with you for behaviors that you would like to see. So maybe, maybe you're working on a sit or a touch or a spin or a shake. Anything is fine here. So the goal here is just to get your dog to have fun inside the house and practice behaviors that are incompatible with reactivity and keep your dog as comfortable and as kind of stress-free as possible. So whatever it is that your dog enjoys here is really kind of what we're trying to hit at. So there isn't really a right or a wrong or a this is perfect or this is perfect. It's really up to your dog's, um, you know, your, your dog's interests and what they like to do. So 
finding what is interesting to your dog and kind of just growing those, um, growing those things there. So managing stressors during high stress times. This is exactly what I was talking about when I was saying, maybe there's a certain time of day where people pass or dogs pass. I find in my neighborhood, it's between 5.30 and 7.30 is the particularly busy time for people to walk dogs. Your neighborhood, it might be noon. Maybe people walk dogs in your neighborhood at noon and you have a dog walker that's in your neighborhood every Tuesday and Thursday. And that might be something um, that you'd want to create a little plan around to help give your dog something to do while those things are happening so that your dog has something already built in that they can do either practicing behavior wise or, or somewhere they can go to be comfortable that's away from those stressors. So remember here, a little note, you can't reinforce fear. So if your dog is uncomfortable, finding them a safe place, moving them to a place where they feel comfortable, wherever it is that they feel best, it might be your bedroom, it might be a basement, it might be a bathroom, a certain bathroom that they like to spend time in when they're nervous. And I will do my best to create as safe of an environment there as possible for them. So wherever you feel like your dog naturally likes to go when they're scared or they're uncomfortable might be a good starting point, but sometimes you have to help them a little bit and actually create that space away from the main living area. So a lot of dogs will want to stay where the people are. So if the people aren't upstairs in the spare bedroom or the office at 6 p.m. on a Tuesday, then they don't want to be there. They prefer to be with um, kind of where the action is, even if that's where the stress is. And so we might have to create a comfortable space for them and really get them okay staying in there by themselves. So things that I'll do, I'll create a safe room or a crate, really good puzzle toys or chew sticks. I really want to make sure that I'm giving my dog as much as humanly possible so that they can feel comfortable during those high stress times. So whatever it is, whatever it takes for us to make sure that they're feeling okay, that they're feeling safe, and that they have something else to do is great. Sometimes you might have to physically be with them in, in really bad times. So something like maybe um, unrelated to reactivity, maybe a thunderstorm, maybe sitting with your dog is comforting for them. And so that's what we do during that high stress time. Um, a radio or TV can also be helpful to just kind of drown out some of that background noise. So some dogs are, which we're going to get into here, some dogs are really uncomfortable or sensitive to sounds. So sometimes they're so in tune that they can hear a dog's tag jingling all the way down the street before they're even in visual eyesight. So just think about what are the things that your dog reacts to? Is it sounds? Is it sights? Is it smells of dogs? Because that's really what you're going to build your management plan around. So for here, we're talking about sounds. Sounds that are triggers for barking are really kind of the things that we're going to want to move our dog away, give them other things to do and prevent our dog from hearing those sounds. Particularly now that it's getting warm and people are starting to open their windows and they're starting to have their dogs out more for walks. This is the time where dogs really struggle that are reactive. So our dogs that are fearful of those things that are fearful of dogs or fearful of people, they're going, you're going to see an increase or you might see an increase in stress when the activity picks up in the neighborhood. And generally that is around spring when the weather starts to be nice. So on days where it's raining, you might be able to have your windows open and your dog is fine because people aren't out walking. Or if your dog is scared of storms, maybe it's the reverse for you. So really just finding out and kind of getting down to what is your dog scared of? What are they frustrated by? What causes their reactivity? What are their triggers? So what I like to do is make a list. So have your sounds and just kind of make a list of everything that you notice that they bark at. Um, and, and then you can start creating your management plan around that. High traffic times in the neighborhood. Again, we kind of went over this already a little bit. We're kind of jumping the gun today. Um, but what we want to do is during those high stress times, we want to make sure that our dogs are moved away and that our dogs have somewhere safe to go. So again, background noise, quiet locations, alternative activities, enrichment, which we'll say a thousand times. Um, management outside of the home. So we're going to jump a little bit here into outside. So that was focused on inside, and now we're gonna focus on what do you do outside. So specifically, when we say outside of the home here, what we're referring to is physically outside of the house, but likely in your dog's backyard. So what we're focusing on here is the backyard itself and the areas where the dog is living. We will in the next lectures get a little bit more into what to do out in new locations, and I think it's two weeks from now is the new location lecture, so you'll get to hear more about that then. So our goals here when we're talking about outside of the home or outside is we wanna create a safe environment to the, 
for the dog to be able to go to the bathroom and sniff around and play in the yard. We think of if your dog can't um, or isn't comfortable in the yard or in their house, then where do they have that is no stressor, trigger-free, low stress? And we think about for a lot of our reactive dogs, something like going outside and going to the bathroom could potentially be very scary if they are reactive and scared of dogs. So maybe they have a dog two doors down that just moved in. Sometimes what we'll see is that those dogs are then afraid to go outside or they're more reactive when they go outside. So you'll see an increase in the reactivity or you'll see that they don't want to go out anymore. And so sometimes varying levels of, of either or both. So we just really want to focus a lot on making sure that outside is a safe place for our dogs. So the way that we do that is we make sure that we prevent access to potential triggers or stressors. So we make sure that they cannot visually access or see any of the things in their world that would potentially be triggers. And I know it sounds tricky. How do we get there? But um, we've got a couple of good creative options for you. So our another goal to that is we want to prevent them from practicing the behavior. So Again, even if the dog, say, say the dog is scared of dogs and they're barking up and down the fence line every time they see a dog, what's happening in, from, from kind of a, the dog's perspective, you think the dog sees a dog, they're scared of dogs, so they bark and they lunge up and down the fence line, and then the dog passes. The next dog comes, the dog sees the dog, the dog barks and lunges at the fence line, the dog passes. What is that dog experiencing in that moment? You think of what's happening from that dog's perspective. From that dog's perspective, they're say, uh, say that they're scared of dogs. We're using fear as an example here. It's not always fear, but we'll use it here. The dog is scared of dogs. Well, the dog is using that barking and lunging and running up and down the fence line as a strategy to help push that other dog away to say, please go, I'm scared, please go, I don't want you here, please go, I'd like you to leave, whatever it is that's, that's happening, we don't quite know. Um, and then the dog leaves. That behavior, if it's working for that dog, is likely to continue to grow just due to the fact that it works. Nothing else makes that dog pass faster. You know, you think of if a dog is nervous, um, especially if a dog is being barked at, they're more likely to kind of go quickly down the street. Um, and so from that dog's perspective, it's working. So Another reason that we want to make sure that we set a good management plan is because we want to make sure that the dog isn't actually being reinforced for that behavior um, because it's something that we'd like to prevent from happening and have a different behavior in the future. So the way that we do that is we make sure that we prevent them from practicing. Another goal is we want to increase the dog's healthy behaviors or behaviors um, that are not things that are, cause the dog stress and then decrease stress overall. So fencing, things to consider. So we think about a lot of different things, um, depending on kind of your scenario and where you live and what your home environment is like, you may already have a fence that you're trying to figure out. How do we make this more safe for our dog? Or you might be building a fence for your dog. We have a lot of options for um, kind of getting creative to get you what you need. And if you ever need any help, just send us an email and we would love to help you kind of plan out how you might create some management um, depending on your budget and your environment and your dog. So things that we want to think about is we want fences that are secure, that are height appropriate. We have the option of a solid fence, which you'll see here on the left, or a chain fence, which we see here on the right, and the distance from sidewalk. So we want to think how far is it from the sidewalk where the dog's potential triggers might be, such as dogs or people. Privacy fencing options. We have a couple, <laughs> a lot of options when it comes to actually fencing itself. A lot of people think, is it a privacy fence or is it a chain link? But we have a lot of different variations in between and things that we can do to get creative to um, kind of come up with the best fence option for you. So standard privacy fencing is just this bottom left photo here. It's just this kind of white or off-white fence here. Just a standard plastic privacy fence or in the top photo, you can see the wooden privacy fence uh, there. Chain link, chain link fence, um, everyone knows there's just a metal you know, the metal chain link fencing. So when we think about fencing, how would we create a barrier for our dogs or how would we manage for our dogs depending on what the situation looks like? A lot of times the just that privacy fence isn't quite enough. So 
a lot of times you need a little bit more space from the dog's trigger. So for example, in this top photo where you'll see all of these bushes, they're actually using this um, kind of hedges and fence flats. They're using a couple different of these, these options here, but you'll see the trees in front. So there's the fence in the back, the trees are in front of that. There's this little white fence here in the corner that's kind of helping to just reinforce that corner there. And then you'll actually see another little garden fence around those bushes. So what that does is prevents the dog from the yard, the side of the yard that we're on, from rushing that fence and reacting or barking and lunging at the dog behind. So for this family, they added a couple extra barriers just to help make sure that their dog wasn't fence to fence with another dog. Because a lot of times, if you're right against that fence line, um, they can see each other, they can hear each other. If they're barking and lunging together, um, that's a pretty unpleasant experience, both for the dogs and the people in the environment. So we want our dogs to be able to, when they go outside, have, be as comfortable as possible and not be in a situation where they feel like they have to get in a fight in their own backyard. So a lot of these extra kind of management steps there help to get us there. So some of our chain link artificial barriers, we can do fence screening. So in this, this little black, you'll see on the bottom right, this little black screening that goes across, that is actually intended for, um, it's intended for chain link fences and you just zip tie it at the top, zip tie it at the bottom, pull it tight, and then it actually acts as a little bit of a privacy barrier. So you can see through it if you have your hands all the way up to it, but it's pretty covered. So it's pretty difficult for dogs to see other dogs or hear other dogs or people from the other side. Um, they can definitely hear them, they cannot see them. Um, the hedges, the hedges are again hedges, you can use trees, you can use bushes, you can use all sorts of things there. So we think of our, our natural barriers um, and we've got a lot of them. In this little middle photo here, this chain link with this, these slats through, those are called fence slots. And those you just weave in and out of the chain link and it just provides a little bit of a barrier for you. So we have quite a few options. Um, this is the same yard here and you can see here where they're managed. So they've got almost all of these actually. Now I just noticed that black fence screening here. I hadn't noticed that previously. So this is that same yard. You'll see how she set up that garden fence all the way around. And then she actually put this little gate in here. So this little door gate here is to prevent the dog from going to the back corner of the yard where there's some um, there are some safety concerns there with the dog's kitty corner and all four of those dogs that are in the yards there that are meeting on that corner. And so we just added a little fence there to prevent the dog from going back there. And now that area can be used for other things that are dog free. So digging, a couple things we wanna think about when we're thinking about fencing, we don't just wanna think about the physical fence structure itself, but also what are the weak points? So digging is one that is dogs that can dig underneath fences. That's something that we really have to think about with our reactive dogs, especially if we think that they might, um, they might escape the yard and could potentially get into trouble with a dog or a person, whether it's um, getting into a fight with a dog on the other side of the fence or charging the mailman or whatever it is. Our dogs can really get into a lot of trouble if they escape our yard. So we want to think about ways that we can set up our plan and our management plan based on what behaviors we've seen in our dog. So if you have seen your dog peeking under the fence or sticking their nose under the fence or um, sometimes looking under or digging under, that's a flag for you that you should start coming up with a management plan just in case the dog digs under or setting up some extra safeties. Put some, putting some extra safeties in place. So you'll see here this little middle photo of this woman in the red shirt here. What they're doing is they're actually putting right on the ground and up the chain link, just a little secondary piece of chicken wire, and that will be zip tied around. And then you can put dirt right on top of that metal there and just blend it in with the yard. You could put grass there, you could put flowers there, you could do anything there. So, but, but it just provides a little bit of a barrier there so that if the dog starts to dig, they're going to hit that chain or that um, chicken wire and they're not going to actually be able to escape. So you'll see here a little bit to the left, someone had put um, some nice little cute cinder blocks there with some flowers in. So that's a, that's a little bit of an idea, especially for the dogs that are um, against another um, a house with another dog on the other side. And then on this right side, far right, 
you'll see just little bricks there. So all they did there was put bricks down so that the dog, if it starts to dig, it's gonna be digging a foot inside of the fence instead of right up against the fence. So lots of things that we can think about when, when we're talking about coming up with, um, with a plan for our dogs that might dig. For this on the right, for these two samples here, these two examples, the one on the far right and the one on the far left, those would be good recommendations for dogs that are maybe not really invested or, or don't really, haven't shown too much of an interest in going under or digging at all, but um, because those are a little bit more high risk, the dogs could shove those out of the way or move them, or um, you know, if they weren't supervised, those could, could, could be moved. And so this middle one is really what we would like you to do if your dog shows kind of a, a high likelihood for digging under the fence. We really, really like that extra L-shaped fencing from the ground. Securing high risk areas, again, this little golden is a, a prime candidate for the dog that <laughs> we need to get some extra fencing in. So you think here of entry and exit points, what are they and how do we make sure that our dogs are safe? So for this here, you'll see just this little, um, on this middle photo here to the right of the golden, you can see there just this little piece that gets put right inside the ground so that the dog here, this golden, we could butt it up right against there and they can't dig out against that, um, against that fence. So we won't be able to put that underground in the same way we did with that L shape against the, the sides, but we could do this at our entry and exit points. Another thing we wanna do to the right here, you will see a lock. So you'll see one lock on the bottom. and the very bottom, there are two little pieces with nice little O-rings with a lock through. That lock has a combination on it. And then up top, you'll see the regular, just a chain around with a carabiner in it. So this does two things here. We wanna think again, think back to the, maybe it is a, um, I don't know, someone coming to check the meter and they're coming into your yard. What I would like in this top one, they could just unloop this little chain link and unhook the carabiner and walk right in. If your dog is reactive towards people, that could potentially be pretty scary for them. If your dog is reactive towards dogs, that would be pretty scary with the idea that the gate might be left open. And if your dog is good with people, even your dog coming outside and seeing someone or being caught off guard by someone standing in their yard, they're going to experience that as a trigger or a stressor. They're likely to experience that as a stressor. Even if they're good with people, that can be pretty scary. So we just wanna make sure that we're minimizing any uncontrolled exposures. And so this really helps us do the trick. So two locks, one with a lock where they would actually have to come around to the front door to say, hey, I went to go and in, get into your yard and I see that it's locked. Um, could you get me the combination or could you come out with me? Which is really what we want when we're talking about uh, making sure that our dogs are safe. Securing high risk areas, fence jumping. So for dogs that have shown any, any type of um, even potential to jump over fences, jump over baby gates, if you have put up a barrier and your dog has uh, kind of worked to, to get it down or pop right over it, then we wanna make sure that our fences are really secure. So we have a lot of options for this. And um, a lot of the times there are things that you can do even using recycled materials to make this happen. So one of the things, the coyote rollers, you can see right here in the middle and on the far right. So what happens there is the dog, even if it climbs up, say it climbs up a chain link fence and it gets to that roller, it's gonna grab that bar on the top and it is actually going to roll. So it just will pull the dog's paws down so that once they get to kind of the top of the fence, they, as soon as they put their paws on the top of the fence, it's gonna pull them back down into the yard. And so it's just, a, it's on a swivel there. So you'll see that little, uh, the little metal bar in the middle and then just PVC pipe right on top and then it just rolls it. So pretty inexpensive to install and is, is pretty wonderful for the dogs that might jump the fence. Um, on the left here, you'll see an L shape of fencing. So what they did here is they just put um, nice little brackets up and then put some uh, mesh or some covering up top. And even that is enough to prevent the dogs from um, even trying to get up there, especially if it's, it's on a fence that's that high. Securing high risk areas, catch pens. So this one is another one that is really, really, really wonderful. So what we like to do, catch pens or little airlock areas, is create some extra safety so that when your dog comes out of the door or anyone who's coming in, there's a little airlock there so your dog isn't just escaping. So in this 
think of this, this far right photo I'm going to talk about first. So here there is a door on the inside. There's that nice little barrier up on the top of those steps. If a dog were to escape the yard or say a, um, say a four-year-old were to be brushing out the door and didn't realize that the reactive dog was behind her, they would get stuck in this little airlock area or this little catch pen here so that they weren't all out and you would have time to be able to come, get the dog, resituate. Okay, now go ahead. Um, or maybe someone is coming to bring mail and I don't want them coming right up to the door because my dog is human reactive. So I might put the mailbox on the outside and put this nice little catch pen so that it's just another little added step where people aren't having to come in unless really necessary, unless they're really unintending to come in. This middle photo here is actually a photo of um, the boarding farm at Canine Turbo Training. There's little Maddie being a little model for us. So what this is, is it helps make sure that dogs are safe so that if any dog comes out that door, they're stuck in this little area too, and they're not getting access to the dogs. You'll see too, another thing to note is that the door itself is a solid secure door with a latch on it. So we wanna make sure that all of the doors we're using are really secure doors, even if it's like this where you're just securing from one side of your property to the other side of your property. There might be really, um, you know, if you're in your backyard, you might not be as um, kind of diligent and making sure that all of your latches are good and all of your, you know, if it's from one side of your backyard to the other side of your backyard, but really anything that leads to the outside or to a potential trigger, we always want to make sure is very secure and solid. On this far left here, you'll see that the, the wooden gate here is going from the porch, so we're standing on the inside of the house, and when you walk out, it's the same type of thing as we have here, where you're just in this little area, which is a really nice place even to be able to have like coffee or tea, um, and maybe your dog is on the other side, so this is actually a backyard that's fenced in here. Um, so maybe your dog is on the other side, and you're on the inside, um, you know, or you have a visitor over, there's lots of things that we can do with these. Um, reminders for friends or family members, so I'm really, um, I really like to have signs when you feel like you are potentially, so anytime that there's any risk where someone is going to make a mistake or is going to have kind of a management fail, I like to make sure that there are extra reminders to ensure that the dogs and the people are safe and comfortable. So you'll see here, um, kind of like what I was telling you about my house here on the right side where that gate is there and I have a dog on the other side of the door, if I have anyone over, if I have anyone at any point that is dog sitting my dogs or that is coming over to walk the dogs or is spending any time with them, I might know how important it is to make sure that those two dogs don't have contact with one another, but the other people in and around that dog don't necessarily operate with the same level of safety and cautious, caution. And so I want to make sure that they are set up for success by just giving little reminders, especially if anything changes. So in my home in particular, one of the dogs is a new dog and I do have people in and out of my home. So I want to make sure that those people that are in the habit of just kind of leaving doors open and leaving gates open and um, inside the house anyway, I want to make sure that they're set up for success so that when they're walking and they're operating just in their normal day to day, they have a little bit of a sign that says, hey, just remember, because it is really hard to forget sometimes when you put an extra baby gate up for the people that aren't paying as close of attention. So the reminders can really help. This one on the left side, this is actually um, a photo of a back door. And what was happening here was twice, um, dog, sweet little dog is reactive to other dogs. And when the person was mowing the lawn or was out walking, they would come in they would start doing yard work and then they would walk into the back door and they would forget that they had left the gate open. And so when we want to, when anytime we want to make sure that there's extra safety, this was a good reminder for that person for a short period of time to remember, oh yeah, we have a dog in the house who's reactive. I need to go make sure that I shut the gate. So some of these can really help set everyone up for success. Also reduces room for error and gets the management plan in writing. So enrich your yard. This is another one that kind of like when I was um, when I was talking about having fun inside of the house. This is another thing that we really want to pay close attention to is making sure that outside your dog has fun things that they can do to both 
um, do high arousal things like maybe play fetch or um, run around or play a little game of chase, but also things that are calm that they can do while they're relaxing, things like comfortable beds and comfortable sleeping areas or comfortable resting zones or maybe their favorite toys or their favorite treats outside, especially for the dogs that have been reacting for a really long time outside, it can be really challenging for them to even do anything other than search for dogs or run the fence line. A lot of dogs, you'll go to maybe give them a treat and they can't even take food outside because the stress or the arousal is so high that it's prohibiting them from even being able to eat. So we think a lot of times at first, what you're doing is you're just giving them a lot of options and figuring out what feels best and what that dog is capable of. So maybe you put up your privacy fence, you put up some fence screening around your yard, your dog can't see dogs, but a lot of times what happens there is they're still looking. So they're still really kind of, um, that's the area where they have seen their triggers over and over and over, and they have rehearsed the behavior over and over. And that's not the same area as they spend, or they, they um, maybe eat their breakfast, or they eat their dinner, or they train with you, or they play. And so what we'll do there is we just make sure that we, we offer our dogs as many things as we possibly can and know that maybe if at first they can't do it, um, that we just make it a little bit easier for them, bring it down, give them something that they can do, and then we want to grow those behaviors. So say your dog, if your dog can't eat when it sees other dogs in the backyard because it's barking and it's lunging and it's searching for dogs, you put up your fence, now your dog is in. What I will do is I will start just saying, can you take this, this nice, really high value food before we walk out the door? And then when we're outside, once, once we're comfortable getting right outside, I will maybe offer them some food, just really um, uh, like a, a couple different options to see. What can you eat out here? Can you eat anything? Can you do anything else? Can we try to train? Can I, will you play ball? Will you play fetch with me? Will you, you know, there are tons of things that we can do, but what we're trying to do here is we're trying to find out what is the dog capable of in that moment? And then we want to grow that as much as possible. So at first, I'll try to restrict access to the yard during the times where I know it's going to be high stress because I don't want them being, maybe they're, um, they're used to running up and down the fence line. I don't want them to be um, kind of trying to fight their urge to send dogs away or to react at the fence line while they're, it's the hardest it's ever going to be. Maybe it's six o'clock on a Saturday and it's very busy in your neighborhood. That's not the first time I'm going to try offering my dog um, you know, a opportunity to play outside. I might do that at a time where it's really early or it's really late or it's a really low key time. It's really quiet in the neighborhood. That's where we're going to want to do this. But regardless, we want to make sure that our dogs have a lot of options in case they want to do something else. So something like a kiddie pool is really nice. This little pond area that you see this greyhound in, that's a beautiful, if there's any natural areas where you can kind of give them things to do naturally, like um, swim or play or uh, run in the tall grass or anything like that. A lot of times what I'll do is I will take dog food or I'll take high value treats and toss them in the yard itself during times where there aren't going to be any triggers or I don't believe there's a high likelihood of seeing triggers. So what I want is I want that dog when it goes outside to have anything else to do other than practice that reactivity. So I will work very hard to be in that time, my dog's partner, and just listen as carefully as I can. If the dog is looking a little bit uncomfortable or stressed where they can't do it and they keep, you know, maybe they run to the fence line and then they rush back and they take a treat and then they rush to the fence line and then they rush back and they take a treat. That's not exactly what I'm looking for there. What I'm looking for when I want the dogs eating food in the yard is to be, for the dogs to be able to be relaxed, to be able to be really, really, really comfortable and eating food and then going right in and then stopping. So I want to try to make those exposures very brief while we build this calm, relaxed experience in the yard and kind of teach them that the yard is going from a place where you were formally defending yourself or barking or lunging or sending dogs away or people away or whatever it is that your dog is experiencing to something where the yard is a place where you relax, you have fun, you, there is a pool, there is maybe play, toys, your favorite thing to do. And we want to make sure that we're there to supervise and help facilitate that experience for them. So if they're starting to get a little bit stressed, we just take them right in the house. 
if they're looking like they're doing great, there's a lot of really great activities that we can do to help make their experience outside a fun one. But just taking away the ability to see um, dogs or people is not necessarily going to do the trick. We really need to kind of give the dog more things to do in that environment. So if you were practicing a behavior that we wanted to end, we don't just want to take it away, but we want to also give you something to do as a replacement behavior in the interim so that you can have fun and be rewarded for choosing other behaviors. So enrich your yard enrichment, we cannot talk about enough. So last thing that we always want to say is we just want to make sure that you have fun with your dog. So when you're outside and you're playing in the yard, we want to choose games that are fun and activities that are stress-free. So something that is always important when you're, you're living with a reactive dog, probably the most important thing that you could do for your dog who's reactive is be their ally and be their partner. So when we think of what a dog who is reactive is experiencing in terms of their day-to-day -day life and the, the triggers or the stressors that they experience, we want really for them to know that there are certain behaviors that pay off, but also that there are certain people that are there as their partner to help ensure that they're set up for success. So we think of, you know, if, if you're able to ever think back at a time where you were struggling with something or you were trying to overcome something, one person in your life who was just always there to help guide you, give you advice when you needed, help set you up for success, give you tools if you didn't have them, help teach you if you didn't know what to do or how to solve the problem. That's an entirely different experience than when you're working with someone trying to overcome all of those same problems and you're met with resistance and frustration and anger. And a lot of times it's very easy to experience those emotions when we're living with reactive dogs because it is really a lot of... Um, behaviors that we find or humans find aversive, things like barking and lunging, and it's embarrassing for people sometimes. It's something that a lot of people have a lot of um, guilt about that their dogs are barking and lunging. Maybe they feel like they did something to cause it. And um, in all, there's, there's all of these kind of negative emotions that can get tacked along um, with owning a reactive dog or being a guardian of a reactive dog. So the most important thing for you and your dog is to know that it's okay, that you're not alone, and that there are ways that you can help limit both the frustration and the fear and the stress for your dog, but also for you. So if nothing else, management is a really great way to kind of create a safe little bubble around your dog's world so that they have a place where they can go and they can just be, and they can exist with you, and they can have fun, and they can be kind of as trigger free as possible so that they do have somewhere that's safe. And ideally that place is where they live. So trying to create a nice safe environment, but also focusing a lot on building a relationship with your dog so that your dog knows that it's okay, that you're there and that you will help coach them and help them if they ever have anything that um, they're struggling with. So recap for outdoor management. So one of our quick recap for outdoor management Few options and recommendations. This is Blue. This is the second dog in my home who is working on making friends with the dog aggressive dog on the other side of the gate. So a nice little welcome to Blue. Um, so a few options and recommendations that we have. Privacy fencing or restricting access to sights and sounds of triggers from the yard. So if you need any help with this, just feel free to shoot us an email and we would be more than happy to help you out. You can contact us by reaching the contact page on our website. Um, we would love, just send us some photos and tell us what's happening, and we would love to help you set up with a plan. Double fencing is, again, that kind of setting up a second fence in the yard. A lot of times what people will do there, that's where you saw that in that shepherd photo, how there was that little wooden gate across the yard. What you can even do is build a fence on the inside of your fence. So you might lose like a foot there around the yard where there's maybe there's your chain link, and then there's another fence one foot in. You might lose maybe a foot all the way around, but you're really gonna add to your dog's comfort if they're not butted up right against another dog on the other side of that fence if they're uncomfortable there. Um, modifications for dogs that have a history of escaping or attempting to escape the yard. So those are gonna be your little L shape in the ground where you put the, put the, um, the fence actually in the ground, a little bit of chicken wire for an L up against the fence. 
and then you cover it with the dirt and then just add on to your yard essentially. Um, catch pens and airlocks, we wanna make sure those are around every area where your dog might get out or people might get in. Uh, locks on gates and safety areas and in, in <laughs> Sorry, that was not supposed to be an extra bullet there. And then also enrichment, just making sure that outside you're giving your dog as much, um, as much enrichment as possible. Indoor management, few options and recommendations, window film, safety locks on doors, baby gates, X-Pen on airlock areas, indoors, signs if needed can be helpful both on inside doors and on outside doors, depending on what you're working with in terms of reactivity and you're really focusing on creating a safe, quiet location for high stress times. And again, enrichment. Um, try really hard when you think of what your dog, when you start adding these management pieces, we want to make sure that you're also adding other things that your dog can do with their time, because if they're not reacting, they're going to need some filler behaviors or some filler activities to do until we get to the point where um, they're actually just really comfortable and they're, um, they feel completely safe and then you can start slowing down a little bit on some of those puzzle toys. But in the front end, when we put up that management, we put up that the window film or the fence covering, we're really doing as much as we can to push as much enrichment as possible, specifically during the times where it's going to be high stress or there's high activity. So things like putting the TV on, putting the radio on, maybe doing that while you're at work might help drown out some of the noises while you're gone but really we're trying to set up um, as much of eliminating those triggers as possible. So if your dog, maybe your, um, your dog isn't reactive to dogs or people, but they're reactive to um, thunderstorms, then window film might not be the best option for you. You might opt for some other options. So for us, when we're talking about reactivity, this is what we're focusing on, but depending on the dog, you'll set up a different, um, a different plan for them. So questions, I am going to go ahead and pop off here. Looks like we are actually at 7.28. So I do not have any time for open questions today. If you want to shoot me an email, feel free to do so. And I would be happy to answer any of your questions. And I will go ahead and respond to everyone who has asked questions on the question and answer um, forum. I'll go ahead and type your answers to you so you have those. Thank you so much for joining us for Peaceful Home. And again, my name is Caitlin. If you need anything, we would be happy to assist you. And we will see you for next week's webinar.